all the other commanders who managed and wanted to enrich themselves because of the position that they had, Mr. Soleimani's parents were living in a clay house in their mountain village until they died. Until they died, they were living in a clay house. Who has seen members of the Soleimani family with a, wearing a Swiss watch? Who has seen members of the Soleimani family lighting a Cuban cigar with a $100 bill? These are the things that sons and daughters of the elites of the Islamic Republic are doing, and they are no longer doing these kind of things in secret. They are putting it on Instagram. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of GNSI's Author Spotlight Podcast. I am Dr. Arman Mahmoudian, and today I have the pleasure of hosting Mr. Ali Alfone. Mr. Alfone is a political scientist, a senior fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute located in Washington, D.C. Mr. Alfone is a prominent expert of Iranian studies. His contribution to the field of Iranian studies has been essential, specifically speaking, since he's the founder and the, developing of the, the developer of a theory on transformation of Iran from a theocracy to a dictator, military dictatorship. Mr. Alfone began his journey on this theory in 2006 by writing on the very same subjects for the Danish Foreign Policy Journal, continuing in 2007 by publishing a series of essays, Iran's Unveiled, How Our Revolution Regards Transforming Iran to an, into a dictator, military dictatorship for American Enterprise Institute. Evidently, the fruit of his works came into 2020 when he published his book, Political Succession in Iran, The Demise of Clergy and the Rise of Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. It's an honor for us to host such an elegant expert. Mr. Alfone, welcome to our podcast. Thank you so much for your kind invitation and thank you for providing me with this opportunity to share my analysis with you. Uh, and I will do my utmost to live up to the generous description <laughs> that you have of me in, in your podcast. Thank you. My pleasure. Very kind of you. Mr. Alfona, in your book, in the first half of the book, the first chapter and the second chapter, which I found it very exciting, you talk about the journey that Ayatollah Khomeini, the founding father of Islamic revolution had to appeal, to uprise and to take over. And you further your argument in chapter three, in the third chapter, where you discuss the challenges and the, the struggles that Khomeini had in securing a long line of succession. His dispute with uh, to a former deputy Ayatollah Hussein Ali Montezeri, which evidently led to this, his disposal from the rank in March 1989 and the disposal, the demolished of the, you know, the deputy, deputy supreme leader. Now it seems Iran is experiencing another succession dilemma. But the only difference is that it's four decades later, Islamic Republic has almost experienced half a century of the existence. And the question is that why they couldn't secure and stabilize themselves in terms of succession, put high command succession at, in about a half a century. And the concerns that they today have regarding who would be the successor of Ayatollah Khamenei, Khan Khamenei, is it similar to the nature the atmosphere when they were had the concerns in late 1980s about who would be the successor of Ayatollah Khomeini? In my book, I uh, make the argument uh, which surprisingly shows that the Islamic Republic was better capable of uh, dealing with political succession during the first decade of the revolution than the situation is today. And one of the reasons was the heart attack that uh, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini suffered really early in, in the revolutionary era. Already in 1980, he had a massive heart attack. He was no longer capable of dealing with the day-to-day -day affairs of the state. And very soon, we saw formation of a very small nucleus of individuals around him who took over the day-to-day -day management of the affairs of the state in Iran. Members of this very small and exclusive group were, first and foremost, Mr. Uh, Akbar Hashimi Rafsanjani, who was a very, very close advisor of Mr. Khomeini's. He was chairman of the parliament, the speaker of the parliament. That is a very important thing. This is the head of the legislature. Next, we had Mr. Khomeini, who himself was not a particularly important individual, but due to his very close friendship with Mr. Rafsanjani, he later became elected 
president of the republic, in other words, the head of the executive branch of the government. The third individual who was a member of this group was a gentleman called Mr. Musavi Ardabili, a cleric who became the head of the Iranian judiciary. So in other words, we have three individuals, representative, representatives of the three br- heads of the br- branches of the government. On top of these three individuals, we had a fourth person, Mr. Ahmad Khomeini, who was the son of the leader. He also had the signet ring of Mr. Khomeini. So whenever a decision was made, he could make it legitimate by sealing and by stamping the documents. In such a way, the Islamic Republic, for all practical purposes, already had a collective leadership during the time that Grand Ayatollah Khomeini was alive but he was not capable of taking care of the affairs of the state. And this was also the arrangement that these four individuals had with each other, that in the case of the passing of Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, they would actually institute a collective leadership of the regime. And when uh, Grand Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini was passing away, his death was imminent, everybody knew it, and they began revising the constitution of the Islamic Republic One of the debates was whether Iran should have an individual leader or a collective leadership. And Mr. Rafsanjani, Mr. Khamenei, Musavi Ardabili, and also Mr. Ahmad Khomeini, all of them, they were arguing in favor of a collective leadership because they knew exactly that they would be members of the leadership council. It makes made, made perfectly good sense. But unfortunately for them and unfortunately for the regime in its entirety and its ability to successfully manage succession, the assembly of experts, which was tasked with the job of revising the constitution, they dismissed the idea of collective leadership. What they were afraid of was confusion concerning responsibility. And I also suspect that many of the assembly of experts members feared that Mr. Rafsanjani was capable of manipulating the other members of the leadership council and could practically declare himself dictator of the new regime. So they denied, they dismissed the idea of a leadership council. Mr. Khamenei was elected the sole leader, and this individual has not been capable of dealing with succession ideas. This is psychologically understandable. No person wants to think about his or her own death and demise. That's problem number one. Problem number two was, as they experienced with Mr. Khomeini, is that as soon as the leader appoints a successor designate or a crown prince, people and elites of the regime will gravitate towards the successor. They will gravitate towards the crown prince because the leader is history. He is old and the crown prince or the successor designate is the future of the regime. And this is something that caused great trouble for the regime when Grand Ayatollah Montazeri was uh, chosen as successor designate. This is not a situation that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei wants to repeat. He has learned from that mistake, but he's committing a new mistake by not having a clear individual being the successor designate. This is why that tragically a regime which is otherwise fairly well institutionalized 45 years after the revolution has still no successor designate. And we do not know who will succeed Mr. Khamenei in office the day that he no longer is among us. Well, this this is really good. It's a good answer and I appreciate it. Specifically speaking, I appreciate when you you mentioned that during Ayatollah Khomeini there was institutional, there was a platform in charge in practice, but right now isn't. But the story that today members of the clergy are telling us is a bit, seems different and also Quite honestly, very vague. Ayatollah Ahmad Khatami, which is very different from the reformist Muhammad Khatami for the sake of our audience. Couple, I believe it was earlier, it was in late 2023. He mentioned, which already been mentioned prior to him, of an existence of the secret or clandestine committee in the assembly of the experts, which the number has been flooding from five to three members, high, high, high level clergy. And he mentioned that, that that committee has a name, a name, if I quote it correctly, but they are keeping it secret for the sake of the uh, security and quote-unquote existential security of that nominee. 
to what extent we can give a credibility to his argument? Because many people are actually making a case that what he says is irrelevant. And I'm quite sure that a few members of the other branches of the government actually, to some extent, question the credibility of that argument. To what extent do you think there is a for, the, the platform that they say they have is effective, is legible, and if it is so secret, to what extent is capable of actually pursuing the assembly of the experts in a post Ayatollah Khamenei era? Several individuals, several members of the Assembly of Experts have talked about a committee, uh, which, as you correctly explained, is identifying individuals who could, could potentially become the leaders of the republic. Even before Atollah uh, Khatami, uh, it was uh, Atollah Rafsanjani who talked about this. He actually was the first individual to mention, you know, uh, about the existence of such a committee. And I suspect he mentioned it just to remind everybody of the mortality of Ayatollah Khamenei and the need to prepare the regime and the country, the state, the government for succession. Now, we do not know that uh, we, we, we know the names of, you know, two members of, of, of the, the, the committee. We do not know the individuals whom they have found worthy of, or of succeeding Ayatollah Khamenei in office. We, we are not aware of those names. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I would say, uh, doubtful concerning the claim that uh, Ayatollah Khatami knows the name of one individual who is the person uh, uh, who will be succeeding Ayatollah Khamenei. I do believe that there is a list. There are certain individuals, but I do not believe that there is consensus, you know, about one individual. That would put everybody in danger, you know, uh, because everybody would, wants to be that person and the person who is the candidate, his life will also be in, in, in danger. And these kind of informations, you know, they, they, they leak somebody will find out, you know, because there are people who have a very, very high stake in this political game. So I do believe that it is safer for the regime and for the assembly of experts not to find one individual, but have a list, a group of individuals who could be. Now, my argument throughout the book, and this is something for which I have been criticized, you know, by, by friends, you know, is that I argue it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter that much who the Assembly of Experts finds and identifies and elects as the next leader of the Islamic Republic. Because Iran today is in a somewhat different situation than the case was back in 1989. Back in 1989, civilian institutions were relatively strong. The Revolutionary Guard was firmly under the control of Mr. Rafsanjani, who was commander-in-chief of the war. The Revolutionary Guard had not managed to deliver during the wartime. They could not deliver victory. They were ashamed of this. They were weakened. Many of the Revolutionary Guard generals, they had cases waiting for them, cases of treason. And uh, Mr. Rafsanjani, always systematic and somewhat Machiavellian, he had been collecting those documents and those court, those court cases. And, and he could use every single of those you know, uh, cases against the generals of the Revolutionary Guard. Today is a very different situation. We have a civilian leadership, which is at times almost at war with each other. Different political factions who have difficulties coexisting. We have a political elites in a society and a regime which is shrinking. You have more individuals being thrown out of the tent. They are no longer among the ruling elites of, of the regime. We have so many former presidents who are no longer active uh, or influential within the regime. Mr. Rafsanjani himself, he died under very mysterious circumstances. Uh, Dr. Ahmadinejad, you know, he is not among uh, the, the, the ruling elites anymore. He's practically a counter elite. Uh, president, you know, former president Mohammad Khatami, he does not even appear on television. I think it caused some kind of a stir, you know, a few months ago when there was video footage of him shown on national television because he had not been shown on television for so many years. So the elite base is shrinking. The civilian institutions are relatively weaker than they were in the past, but there is one organization which has become stronger day by day, and that is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. So just as Mr. Rafsanjani and his network, they were capable of identifying Mr. Khamenei as a leader, doing the lobbying work for him when the idea of a collective leadership collapsed, they could no longer pursue that idea, and made him leader. Now we have a different group. 
this group is not civilians. This group is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. In my opinion, they are capable of imposing their will and imposing their candidate on the assembly of experts. And whoever, even if they do not you know, impose their candidate, whoever is elected leader in the Islamic Republic of Iran depends for his physical survival on support from the Revolutionary Guard. This regime cannot survive. They cannot face and suppress the domestic opposition unless they have the support of the Revolutionary Guard. And therefore, they have become practically, practically hostages in the hands of their own Praetorian Guard. Wow. You mentioned about the lease and then IRGC. I want to go, I want to actually a little bit go back to the list and then continue with the IRGC. About the list, there was a narrative forming after your book. And the narrative was that Ayatollah Khamenei has been aggressively, had been aggressively pushing for protrating Ibrahim Raisi, the former president, bringing him to the public from the security and uh, spectrum to the politics, making him a public figure. And he kind of went through a whole stages of evolution, specifically speaking, him being the uh, chancellor of the Tolia, Astana Tolia. It was very cleric and symbolic move running the, the holy Shia shrine in, the, in Iran. And then he died in a, car, in, a, in a helicopter clash, which is a very interesting. And, you know, still people are debating over it in 2024, a couple of months ago. The narrative about Raisi was, Raisi was being, bringing up to the public's attention. He was, his position was evaluated and escalated in order to be the either the next supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei succession, or be the smoother of transition, be the person who as the head of the executive branch, which in absence of the supreme leader would de facto would be the head of the at least administration of the country, to smooth the transition of power to the person who Ayatollah Khamenei had in mind or assembly of the experience. Raisi is no longer in the picture. And Islamic Republic definitely seems to have a very struggling problem in replacing him. How do you evaluate the absence of Raisi on the succession and also the role that IRGC can play in the succession? Your questions are very relevant. And I do share the uh, analysis uh, that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei was inclined uh, to promote the career of Mr. Ibrahim Raisi. He had been doing it for a relatively long time. He wanted uh, Raisi to be elected president. That is why he eliminated practically every uh, uh, useful candidate, every candidate who was, you know, just somewhat independent and capable of beating Mr. Raisi in, in, in elections. Uh, that is why he went to those extreme lengths uh, to, to, to so-called, you know, engineer the election and get Mr. Raisi elected into, into office so that he has executive responsibility and executive uh, uh, experience uh, and also become a better known individual. Now, uh, luck would have it that the Revolutionary Guard also was in favor of a Raisi presidency and perhaps even leadership because they perceived uh, Mr. Raisi as a malleable individual who was a very weak person, who had no will of his own, they could shape him as they wanted to. So Mr. Raisi would become a head of state uh, who in reality is uh, playing a rather, you know, ceremonial role, you know, if we can imagine the role of the king of Sweden in Swedish politics. That would be the role that the IRGC had in mind for Mr. Ibrahim Raisi. Uh, Mr. Khamenei's understanding of him and, and, and Raisi's role, I'm not entirely sure about, but he may have had his own reasons to support Mr. Raisi's career. But in, certainly, Mr. Mr. Raisi would be an individual with whom the Revolutionary Guard could, could, could work. Now that the, that plan crashed along with the helicopter and, and there is nobody else, you know, to fulfill that role. The other candidates who have been discussed in the public, and I'm not sure if there is any credibility to these reports, but the other candidates, none of them are particularly interesting from the viewpoint of the Revolutionary Guard. There was one theory, uh, somewhat controversial, uh, that uh, Mr. Khamenei or, or the Assembly of Experts under pressure from the reformist camp, 
uh, and in an, in an attempt to reach out to the Iranian public, which is very critical of the regime in many ways. We see that with, you know, declining election in, you know, election participation and voter turnout. Uh, they would be pointing at Mr. Hassan Khomeini, a grandson of the founder of the Islamic Republic, you know, who has the magical Khomeini name. But he says he has, you know, he has a uh, somewhat, you know, liberal image and it may be acceptable to, to some sections of the Iranian population. I, I never, you know, uh, subscribe to this, you know, theory, but he was one of the names. This person, I'm sure, would not be acceptable to the Revolutionary Guard. Then there were some who said that, well, the Revolutionary Guard can systematically eliminate network of Ayatollah Rafsanjani and also, which network, by the way, a network which has since been inherited by Mr. Hassan Rouhani, the former president. And then once Mr. Hassan Rouhani is alone and isolated, they could actually have him as a leader because he's competent, you know, he knows and, you know, understands the, the, the influence and the language and power of the Revolutionary Guard, but at the same time, he's competent, a very competent leader. You cannot have an individual like Rouhani who, was, who also has a network of his own, but if he's alone and isolated, then the RGC can control him and that would not, not be such a bad idea. Uh, again, you know, I think that there are so many grudges that the Revolutionary Guard is holding against Mr. Rouhani. Uh, let's not forget that the uh, member of the parliament who consistently spoke against granting more powers to the Revolutionary Guard in the uh, Statute of the Guard in 1983, it was actually Hassan Rouhani. He would go to the to the to the uh, pulpit of, of the parliament and he, he, he would talk about the dangers of giving so many, granting so many powers, vast powers to the Revolutionary Guard. They had another fight when they were trying to establish the Ministry of Intelligence. Uh, Rouhani was pushing it, you know, and, and, and Raf Sanjani and Mr. Khamenei, they were pushing, you know, the agenda behind, you know, the curtains. But it was Rouhani who was the face of the enemy from the viewpoint of the Revolutionary Guard. It was Rouhani who was trying to curtail their power. So again, you know, I have difficulties believing that the Revolutionary Guard would try, you know, a, a power sharing agreement with a, an individual whom they believe is capable of outfoxing them, you know, because Mr. Rouhani is what Mr. Raf Sanjani was, a, a Machiavellian prince. That is exactly what he is. Uh, then there have been consistent rumors, you know, especially expressed by by uh, uh, Iranian older generation, you know, Iranian analysts, you know, in, in, in Persian language, television channels broadcasting from Los Angeles, consistently talking about Mr. Mushtaba Khamenei, you know, one of the sons of Mr. Khamenei replacing him. Uh, but the problem of this theory uh, is that we have no idea what Mr. Mushtaba Khamenei is doing. There are no public reports. Now, I keep an open eye uh, uh, looking at every single news report on the physical uh, uh, location and being of Mr. Mustafa Khamenei. Every single thing. And I can find maximum two to three references to him actually reporting his physical presence in Iran in the Persian language open sources. Only two to three. You see him on, on participate in Revolution Day rallies. You see him participate in Quds Day rallies, uh, the last uh, uh, Friday of the month of Ramadan, and then usually a third occasion. That can be a random occasion. Only three references. We don't know who he meets. We don't know where he is geographically. We have no idea who, who his networks is. So, so I, I find it very, very difficult uh, uh, to believe those uh, who claim that they know for sure that Mr. Mojtawa is going to be the successor. So I think for some time, the regime will be looking for a successor. Uh, and I do not know who that successor will be. But the argument I'm making is that in the end, it will be the Revolutionary Guard running the affairs of the state and the leader of the Islamic Republic will be a ceremonial head of state, whoever it will be. Before going to uh, next question, I want to ask a quick question. So you... For now, you rule out Mushtaba Khamenei as the nominee, as a, as a grand nominee for uh, the succession. Uh, I I am not ruling anyone out, but yes, I'm so. also not making the argument that you know mm -hmm. it is going to be Mr. Mushtaba Khamenei because uh, uh, there are plenty of analysts you know making that argument, and and I simply don't see the physical evidence. You know there is there is no evidence, there is no account of it in in the open sources. Uh, it may be interesting for for our listeners to know that the first time we heard about existence of Mojtaba Khamenei was relatively late. It was in 2005. Before that, nobody knew the name of the children of 
Mr. Khamenei. Nobody knew the names of, of the children. The complain and, and in 2005, Mr. Karabi complained about alleged, you know, presence of Mr. Uh, Mojtaba Khamenei in the campaign headquarters of Mr. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, which would be signaling to the voters that, you know, the leader wants Mr. Ahmadinejad elected. That was something that Mr. Karabi was complaining against. After that, we learned, you know, got to learn the name of Mr. Mojtaba Khamenei. The rest of the names of, of the children of Mr. Khamenei only became known in 2009 when uh, uh, one of the sons of Ayatollah Rafsanjani took refuge in London at a very nice hotel, began meeting all sorts of Iranian political activists and told them the names of Mr. Rafsanjani's children. Before that, we had no idea what the names of the children were. And it was also at that time uh, that uh, one very famous Iranian filmmaker aligned himself with this son of Mr. Rafsanjani and, and they wrote, you know, a somewhat ridiculous, ridiculous report uh, about the alleged, you know, billion dollars worth of, of the Khamenei uh, family, claiming to know even the bank account numbers in Swiss banks. Now, I have to admit, you know, I even don't know how much, you know, my, how, how much money my brother has in the bank account. So how could these people, you know, tell us, uh, Mr. Mahmalbaf and, you know, this son of Mr. Rafsanjani, and Johnny, uh, Mohsen Hashemi, how could they know, you know, this information about how much money who has in which bank account? And they had prepared the list, you know, with all the kids and their bank accounts. I simply don't believe this kind of tales. I don't, I have difficulties. I need to see physical evidence telling me that Mr. Mushtaba is a serious candidate. I have not seen that, uh, that, that uh, piece of evidence yet. Thank you. And I think prior to Mo Mohsen Hashemi's visit to London, the public perception was Mojtaba Khamenei is the oldest son too. I think that was the public perception, which he is not. No, no, he no, is not. exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, for the next question, because you mentioned IRGC, I want to ask about another absent figure that actually was absent, was taken to be absent right in the time of publication of your book in 2020. General Qasem Soleimani. So your theory is there is a transformation from clergy theocracy to a military dictatorship. We do know, as Hassan Rouhani, the former president, uh, mentioned, IRGC owns Ghana and media. And we do know, as the president prior to him, Ahmadinejad, called IRGC the smuggler, smuggler brothers. IRGC owns actually a great chunk of Iran's economy. I think next to the foundation, IRGC handles about one, they combine together, about a, between half, one third to, one, to half of Iran's economy. So they have the wealth, they have the resources, they have the material capability. But well, still, I, they may or may not, it is up to you to say, a need for a public pusher. And a public pusher, a person who can sell the theory to the public, should be somebody who has at least a relevant relatability. I don't want to say popularity because it's a strong word, but rela relevant relatability to public. Among all of the IRGC commanders, post Ayatollah Khamen, post war era, that was a different time. The only one who seemed to possess a level of relatability or even popularity among some Iranian, at least comparably more than the other IRGC generals, in a very notable gap, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you know the subject way better than me, was Qasem Soleimani. He was taken out of the United States Central Command in January 2020. How do you think, do you, and let me rephrase the question, do you think the absence of Soleimani would make any impact on IRGC's plan to take over either de facto or formally after the Ayat imposed Ayatollah Khamenei era? Major General Qasem Soleimani was an exceptional, exceptional individual. He was a very simple man from extremely modest background in a mountain village in Kerman province. He had five years of schooling, after which he moved to Tehran, took the bus. That was the only car that he had seen in his entire life. That was a minibus traveling between his village of Rabor and the central part of city in Kerman. He went to Kerman to work as a construction worker, fifth grade. He had just finished school. And he did it because he wanted to pay off his father's debt. So his father was a peasant. He had become indebted. We do not know why. And the entire family was, that, was fearing that the father would end up in a debtor's prison. Qasem Soleimani worked, saved all his money, returned to Kerman, 
paid off his father's debt in full. From that day, he was the hero of the village. Hero of the village. But I also suspect that the village was too small for him. So he returned to, to Kerman. He studied at nights. During daytime, he was still working as construction worker. And then he studied to get a job at the water, local water company in Kerman. Then came the revolution. And worse, the civil war in Iran's Kurdistan region. Now, unfortunately, whenever the central government in Tehran is weak, we see independence movements and separatist movements in the periphery regions of Iran. This was particularly true in Iran's Arab-populated areas, in Khuzestan, in Kurdistan, in Iran's Turkmenistan region. There were some disturbances, but nothing serious. Not a real, you know, separatist movement over there. So Mr. Soleimani volunteered for the war effort. He took part in the civil war in Iran's Kurdistan. He saved Kurdistan region for Iran. So Iran did not break. This is something that Iranians remember him for. They also remember him for fighting against the Iraqi invasion of Iran for eight years. He dedicated, dedicated eight years of his youth fighting the Iraqis. After the end of the war, this man dedicated his life to fighting drug smugglers, contraband smugglers at the Iran-Afghanistan. And it was exactly because he became an expert in Afghan politics and the fight against the Taliban that in late 1990s, when we saw the rise of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan, he was appointed the chief of the Quds Force. It was because Iran at the time believed that the greatest threat to Iran's security came from the East, from Afghanistan. And we know the rest of the story. But undeservedly, in the United States of America and among CENTCOM, this man is infamous for being responsible for death of American servicemen and servicewomen in Iraq. This is very, very unfortunate. Because most Iranians remember him for something else. They remember him for the sacrifices that he made in Iranian Kurdistan during the war with Iraq and fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan. Then the Iranian public discovered this man as Iran's hero in the fight against Daesh, Islamic State. Of course he was popular. Iranians who were sympathetic to the Islamic Republic, they supported him because he's the chosen hero of the regime and the propaganda machinery is working in, for him. Iranians who are not necessarily supportive of the regime, but are Iranian nationalists, they loved him because he fought for Iran. He sacrificed everything for the sake of the territorial integrity of Iran. So I was not at all surprised when we saw a million people going out to the streets of Tehran, marching at his, uh, during his funeral service. I was not at all surprised. This man was popular. The other thing which is also quite unusual about the Islamic Republic, he was not corrupt. Unlike every single other individual, all the other commanders who managed and wanted to enrich themselves because of the position that they had, Mr. Soleimani's parents were living in a clay house in their mountain village until they died. Until they died. They were living in a clay house. Who has seen members of the Soleimani family with a, wearing a Swiss watch? Who has seen members of the Soleimani family lighting a Cuban cigar with a $100 bill? These are the things that sons and daughters of the elites of the Islamic Republic are doing, and they are no longer doing these kind of things in secret. They are putting it on Instagram. They call it the rich kids of Tehran and all the other things which, which are totally disgusting. The Iranian public is disgusted with that. And therefore, it made perfectly good sense from Iranian propaganda to promote Mr. Soleimani as a national hero both when he was alive and now that he no longer is among us. Did he play 
Or could he have played a role in succession? Probably yes. I do believe that. Yes, yes. But at the same time, I also know that the Revolutionary Guard's method and approach to governance is very different than the type of military dictatorships that we have seen in South America or in Spain, you know, during Franco. This is a very different type of approach. It resembles the Pakistani military's approach. So the military does not assume public office and political office directly, but has so much power that it is deciding the national security strategy of the state and is also distributing the wealth of the nation. In Iran's case, mostly the oil money. That would be the preferred approach of the Revolutionary Guard for the simple reasons that the problems that Iran and the Iranian state are facing are insurmountable. No one can, in a short time, fix Iran's healthcare system. In the short period of time, no one can fix Iran's youth unemployment problem. In the short time, no one can solve the traffic problem in Tehran. In the short term, nobody is capable of bringing about sanctions relief from the United States so they can kickstart the Iranian economy. In other words, if under such circumstances, even, even if a very popular individual like the late uh, Major General Soleimani takes power in such a country, he will end up being extremely unpopular because he cannot deliver. So it is better and wiser from the perspective of the Revolutionary Guard to have a civilian politician who comes to office, is elected, and is blamed by the public for the shortcomings of the regime. Be blamed. Thank you. I want to wrap this podcast with a question. Well, when I started this, uh, my journey in political science, I've been told if you know one country, you don't know much. If you don't, if you know two countries, you may know something, which brings us to comparative politics. Islamic Republic being compared to many, you just made a comparison with Pakistan. Some believe that in, in, in some senses, Islamic Republic of Iran is very similar to the Soviet Union. Ideological bond, aging, hostility toward the West and all. Well, when it comes to the Soviet Union and collapse of the Soviet Union, most of us focus on their collapsing economy, the expansion, and political uh, disogma and others. But one thing that been kind of, I, I believe, been neglected, neglected was the leadership problem. Soviet Union had an aging leadership. And in a way, from 1982 to 1985, the country has seen about four leaders. In 1982, Berzhenev died. Then we had Andropov for two years, and then Andropov in 1984 passed away, power to the Chernikov, and again, Chernikov was survived for a year, and we have Gorbachev. I believe these forceful recyclation of the political high command kind of made it impossible for Soviet Union to pursue any reform if even they wanted it. And the moment they got it, it was too late when the Gorbachev took over. Islamic Republic is very aging, first generation of the uh, revolution has almost died. Ayatollah Khamenei, I believe, is the last survival of stuff that generation. Do you think a succession in Iran can pave the ground for the collapse of regime in Iran or the regime change in Iran? I'm always fascinated by uh, compar com comparisons, you know, between, between Iran and other political systems, you know, because I, I think much of it actually does make sense. Uh, also the comparison with the Soviet Union. However, the Islamic Republic has demonstrably been much more flexible than the Soviet regime, far more flexible. Uh, the, uh, just to, you know, start with the economy, imagine that, you know, the United States of America managed to impose maximum pressure campaign against Iran's economy, reduced Iran's oil exports to almost 5% of pre-sanctions. But nevertheless, the Islamic Republic's economy managed to, you know, keep afloat. You know, the regime survived the Trump administration and the maximum pressure campaign. Why? Because they shifted uh, and they partially compensated for the loss of income from oil revenue, you know, uh, with, with, with increasing production of steel 
stole steel production and steel exports, you know, which was not, you know, uh, covered by the sanction regime, managed to some extent, you know, to keep Iran afloat economically. Now, in a command system economy like the Soviet system, you know, you could not do such a thing. The other thing which they could not in the Soviet Union, you know, it was to use private networks because everything was government. Now, Iran has a very different approach to these kind of things. Yes, government is important, but networks are much more important. So when they wanted to smuggle Iran's oil abroad, uh, they practically said to any government institution, you know, or for that matter, private individuals, if you are willing to take the risk of selling Iran's oil, you can have X percentage of, of, of the oil revenue. And they manage, you know, to, to export Iran's oil and sell it in, in the black market. Now, for a fraction of a price of, 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 of the, you know, of the global market price. But nevertheless, they managed to bring in money. Even when it comes to the matter of succession, uh, the, the big difference, in my opinion, between the Soviet system and the Iranian system is that the Soviet Union had the Communist Party. Yeah. Iran has no Communist Party. Uh, but there is the Revolutionary Guard, which is at times assuming the dual roles, not only just of the political party of, of let's say, of the Communist Party, but also of the KGB. So it has the dual roles, you know, but, but even, even vaster than that in so many ways. Until the dying days of the Soviet Union, the Red Army was under civilian political control, completely. Yeah. Even, even the KGB, you know, was under some kind of, you know, party control. In Iran, that's not the case. And that gives and provides some degree of flexibility to, to the regime, uh, which on many occasions it, it weakens the regime, but at other times it provides the regime with the needed flexibility and organization to adapt to new challenges. So this is why that I am not entirely sure that Iran will be ending the same way as the Soviets, but they themselves are very much aware of it, particularly when it comes to social uh, issues. Uh, back during the days of uh, Mr. Uh, President Mohammad Khatami, the regime uh, jokingly called him Iran's Ayatollah Gorbachev. They did that for a reason, because here you had a political reformer who wanted to reform the system, but in doing so would also uh, give, I would say, increase political demands for more freedoms. And that would be very, very dangerous from, from the regime's perspective. Now with the Revolutionary Guard, you know, coming to power, their uh, strategists and their theoreticians, they need to think very carefully what kind of freedoms they're willing to give the public and what kind of freedoms they cannot afford to give the public. From my perspective, uh, and, and, and this is regardless of who will be the leader, the next leader, if they want to survive, if the regime wants to survive and if the regime wants to avoid a Gorbachev scenario, they can give some freedoms which do not cost politically. For example, the issue of hijab. When you look at videos coming out of Tehran today, particularly Tehran, at the street level, 15 to 20% of women are not wearing any kind of hijab. That tells me that the regime has lost that battle and is no longer even trying to enforce the hijab legislation. Yes, every once in a while there are cases of imprisonment, even beating of these young ladies, but for the most part, the regime is living with it because it is not a threat. Personal freedoms, individual freedoms do not threaten the existence of the regime. I think the Revolutionary Guard has le learned that lesson. So if you allow people to wear what they want, if you allow people to have a quiet drink at a street cafe, if you allow people to go to parties, then you have, but you at the same time are not willing and, and, and certainly should not for this kind of regime, give political freedoms, then you have Iran of Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. And I suspect a very large part of Iran's population would be perfectly happy living such a life. Or at least don't endanger their life to revolt against it. That too. It is always a relatively smart part of the population which is politically minded and demands political freedom. I, 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 and, 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 you know, the, not everyone, you know, is, is, is willing to, to, to fight, kill and get killed in order to overthrow the Islamic Republic. Uh, but we will see if the Revolutionary Guard has this kind of wisdom that the Rafsanjani generation of reformers had. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that, that is something that is left for us to, 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 to wait and see. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Alphone. And to you, our audience, I appreciate that you've been with us all this time. I appreciate you 
watching this podcast. But before letting you go, I want to ask you one more favor. I want you to go and look at the description of the video. Find the link to Mr. Alphona's book. Get it, read it, and enjoy it. Once again, it was great to have you here.